Great. All right. Well, let's get started, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We've got a pretty special um, pair of presentations for you all that um, we're, we're very excited to offer. Uh, my name is Nate Webb. I'm the Wildlife Director for Maine Fish and Wildlife. And today we're going to be having a discussion and some presentations on chronic wasting disease, which is a, a huge issue for us here in Maine and across the country um, with regard to deer and moose populations and other species of um, members of the, the cervid family or the deer family. Um, so we're going to be having a, a couple of presentations. We'll take some questions. Um, if you have questions as we go, please enter those in the chat on YouTube. We'll answer uh, those that we can right in the chat and we'll also hold a few to the end and um, pitch those to our panelists verbally so we can have a bit more of a discussion. Um, so without further ado, we'll, we'll just get started. I want to introduce our first panelist, uh, Dr. Kristen Schuler. Um, Kristen is a wildlife disease ecologist and co-director of the Wildlife Health Laboratory at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. She has worked on a variety of species, including big game like bison, moose, elk, and deer, and she is interested in maintaining healthy populations. Kristen started working on chronic wasting disease in 2002 during her doctoral research at Wind Cave National Park in South Dakota. She continues to do research on CWD and consults with a number of states on prevention measures and surveillance strategies. And I just want to say that we're very um, fortunate to have Dr. Schuler with us today. Um, she was here in Maine in, I believe, January of this year and gave a presentation to the legislature and a public uh, presentation as well at the Augusta Civic Center. Um, those were very well attended. And um, I think the attendees at those were really interested to hear what she had to say. Um, so we're excited that she's able to offer this presentation uh, virtually. Um, when Kristen wraps up, we'll switch over to Nathan Bieber, our deer biologist. I'll introduce him when he comes on and give a little bit more detail on his background. But I think with that, we'll just get started. I'll turn it over to Dr. Schuler, and we'll learn more about chronic wasting disease. All right, let me share my screen. Okay, are you seeing the correct presentation? We are. Okay. All right. Well, um, thank you so much for, for having me back. It, it's really uh, an honor to, to speak to you on uh, the status of chronic wasting disease in North America. And it's something I've been working on for a long time, but it's also a topic that really hits home for me, not just because I've been studying it for such a long time, but also because I'm a hunter and a mother. So this is my little boy right here with the deer that I shot last winter. And I wanna make sure that he has the same opportunities that I've been able to enjoy with wildlife. So let's start with the most common question, which is what does CWD look like? Well, I could rattle off a bunch of stuff like emaciation, drooling, drooping ears, uh, an animal might be easily approachable, but the truth is that you're much more likely to see a CWD positive deer like this, a uh, perfectly normal adult buck that was harvested during the hunting season. This guy's super happy about you know, his, his deer that he got. And then uh, a week or so later, he's gonna find out that that animal has CWD after he gets it tested. So what is CWD? It's in the family of diseases known as transmissible spongiform encephalopathies or TSEs. Now, some of you may have heard of mad cow disease, which is a similar disease in cattle. And TSEs are caused by a prion or a misfolded protein. We have normal prions in our bodies, but when an abnormal prion gets into our body, it causes the other normal prions to misfold its shape and then it can no longer be broken down by the proteases, which are part of the bodies that break down proteins. And these diseases are universally fatal. There's uh, categories of these diseases that occur in humans uh, through genetic uh, abnormalities. And there is no treatment, there is no vaccine, and there is no true genetic resistance. Now, CWD was first discovered in 1967 in a captive facility in Colorado, and it naturally affects deer species. So we're talking about whitetails, mule deer, elk, moose, and reindeer. In this talk, I'll, I'll focus mainly on whitetail deer 
um, but it does affect those other species. And the problem is that a lot of these animals appear perfectly normal and they may live up to two years before they die from CWD. While they're infected, live animals shed prions in their saliva, feces, and urine. So they actually contaminate the environment. And then when you add in scavengers like crows or coyotes that can consume tissues from these animals and not get actually infected, but they can spread prions that remain infectious in their feces. And because prions are proteins and not a living thing, they can actually remain infectious for years. So to get rid of prions, you need really harsh chemicals like bleach or high temperatures to the tune of 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. So the prions are not inactivated by uh, our traditional cooking temperatures. Prions also have an ionic charge. So they, act, they bind to certain soil particles, particularly clay soil and become more infectious. So obviously if you have a fatal disease, you probably aren't going to live as long, but infected animals are also more likely to be killed by a predator, which includes hunters or vehicles uh, during that time. And with males, especially in white-tailed deer, they're more likely to be infected than females. In certain populations in Wyoming, there have been serious declines in the white-tailed deer at 10% of the population annually, mule deer are severely affected at 21%, and elk populations seem to be a little bit more resilient, 13% declines uh, in heavily CWD infected areas. So this is a picture of a nice white-tailed buck from the CWD zone in Wisconsin. And where that deer decomposes, it will actually leave prions on the landscape. And experiments have shown that plants like tomatoes, corn, wheat, and alfalfa will take up those prions from the soil into their plant tissues. So I don't know about you, but I like to eat some of those plants. And this is where we start uh, getting worried about people getting CWD. So let's address that. The major concern with CWD is it is very similar to mad cow disease, which killed about 223 people worldwide, so not a huge number. However, no humans have been infected with scrapie, which is a similar TSE found in sheep. So we have conflicting evidence from these diseases, from mad cow and from scrapie, but at present there are no known cases of CWD in humans. And what we think is that there is a species barrier uh, between the proteins that you would find in a deer versus those that you would find in a humans, that it's sufficiently different to stop the infection. But the problem is that we don't know what a human form of CWD would look like. Uh, so your doctor wouldn't know how to look for it and testing for it is also very difficult. The interesting thing is that researchers are finding out more similarities between other neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and dementia that are not related to CWD or these TSEs at all, but it may give us some clues about why TSEs form these protein plaques on the surface of brain cells, which essentially smothers the brain cell and kills it, leaving a hole where the neuron should be. So that goes back to the transmissible spongiform encephalopathy. Spongiform because your brain actually starts to resemble a sponge with holes in it. Now there's an ongoing study in Germany with macaques, which are a species of primate that most closely resembles humans that you can use in laboratory research. The researchers fed the monkeys brain material and skeletal muscle from infected deer and some of the animals uh, became diseased. Now the study hasn't been published yet, it's not quite finished, but the preliminary results were convincing enough to the Centers for Disease Control that they changed their recommendation so that no human would knowingly consume CWD positive venison. And remember the cooking does not inactivate the prion. So now you're probably wondering where is CWD closest to Maine? Most recently, it was reported in a captive red deer herd in Quebec that has been depopulated. The captives are shown in yellow circles if they have been depopulated and red circles if the herd is still in operation. In the wild, the affected counties are shown in gray. Now, 
in the wild, the closest known affected deer are in Pennsylvania on the, on the East Coast. And I'll talk a little bit about, more about the situation in New York because it's shown on the map, but there's no active CWD that we're aware of at this time in New York. So you can see the progression of the disease since 2000. And New York is the only state to have eliminated CWD once it was found in the wild. Now the disease has made some big jumps. So we know that it's not just natural deer movement spreading CWD. And if we look at the evidence, hunters are doing a lot of moving. I don't think we had any idea of the magnitude of hunter movements of carcasses. This map uh, was created by Brian Richards at USGS and demonstrates over 32,000 deer harvested in a four county area of Wisconsin where CWD is most common. Yes, some actually went to Maine. Deer even went to Alaska and Hawaii. And just for reference, Wisconsin found over a thousand CWD positive deer in 2018. And most of them were from this area in Southern Wisconsin. And the problem is only about one in eight deer in Wisconsin are tested for CWD. So most of these hunters probably didn't even know they were potentially moving the disease. And that goes back to what we were talking about with the carcass. If you take a whole carcass home with you to another state and whether you process it yourself or you have a, a butcher do it for you, disposal of that carcass becomes very important because if the head and the spinal cord, which are some of the tissues with the highest concentrations of prions are thrown out on the landscape, then it can contaminate the environment and create a new outbreak. And since we're talking about Wisconsin, let's dive a little deeper because it's easy to see why this is a worst case scenario. Last year, prevalence in one part of a county in Iowa County was as high as 55% in adult bucks and 35% in adult does. And some of the modeling done in Wisconsin indicates that populations would start to decline if the prevalence increases above 27% in does. Not to mention that if you shoot the wall hanger of a lifetime, you'd have a better than 50-50 chance of that deer being infected. So over time, you can see how the prevalence has increased across age classes in bucks. When the outbreak first started in Wisconsin in 2002, you weren't likely to see many yearling bucks infected. And as the environment has become saturated with prions, deer are more likely to pick up prions and become diseased. And that testing um, would then pick that up earlier. So these are the results of a study happening right now in Wisconsin where they're collaring animals and then uh, monitoring their survival. And it's shown that there's a 20 to 30% drop in the survival of deer with CWD, particularly in bucks during the hunting season. So if you have holes in your brain, you are less likely to be vigilant for a hunter and more likely to be shot. But it's not all bad news. There are some positive examples to point to. And the big positive for Maine is that you are in a good position right now to decide that you don't want to get CWD in your state and take actions to prevent it. So let me tell you what happened in New York. In 2005, CWD was detected in a captive white-tailed deer uh, herd. Trace outs from that herd led to a second facility. And they actually hit the trifecta on this one because not only was the index herd owner, uh, he had his own deer and he transported deer, but he also did taxidermy and allowed uh, wild fawns that were in for rehabilitation access to his taxidermy shop and to his captive deer. So uh, that person cooperated, pointed out where he had released some of these uh, rehabilitated animals and two additional wild deer, a 10 month old fawn and a two year old doe were discovered from that. Since 2005, no additional CWD positive animals have been discovered. And that's the result of a pretty significant effort because after the detection, the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation went in, uh, they set up a containment zone around those facilities and around those wild deer. They did targeted removals on several occasions and made a lot of regulation changes. So you couldn't move whole carcasses outside of that containment zone. 
no wildlife rehabilitation was permitted, there was no movement of live animals, and so on. So the containment zone ended in 2010, and in 2011, we put together an interagency CWD working group with wildlife and agricultural representatives. And this is especially relevant because Pennsylvania, New York's neighbor to the south, found CWD in wild and captive whitetails in 2012. And we were fortunate that the New York Department of Agriculture and Markets put in place a five-year ban on the import of all live captive cervids into the state. And this ban has subsequently been made permanent. We went ahead and developed a weighted risk-based surveillance system statewide to sample more where the risks were the highest and the deer densities were highest. And our working group wrote a response plan with an aggressive action to determine the extent of the outbreak and reduce local deer densities. And as we were writing this response plan, we thought, well, this is dumb. We don't want to have to use this plan. So why don't we actually write a prevention plan? And that ended up being the New York State Risk Minimization Plan, which bans the import of intact deer carcasses from all states, bans feeding and baiting statewide, and emphasizes education and outreach to stakeholders. So to give you an example of our surveillance, we assess risks from how CWD could come into the state from human activities and how prions could get into the deer population. We surveyed taxidermists, processors, and captive servant facilities as these were deemed to be potential hazards. So you can see that the risks weren't necessarily where the deer populations were the highest, but we wanted to incorporate elements of both of those in how we were doing our sampling. Obviously, if there's not many deer in the area, uh, you don't have to worry about CWD, but um, you do where the population densities are higher and there's more risks. The other thing we started doing was partnering with taxidermists to get samples from those older age class bucks so we could test them. And so we did training from via DVDs and YouTube videos for taxidermists and have 29 participating taxidermists for the last few years. And these taxidermists get paid to collect the retropharyngeal lymph nodes, which are, are found just sort of behind the jawbone, um, the lower jaw in the deer's head. And that's what we need for the tissue that we need for testing. And it's something that they would normally just throw away, but the taxidermists actually have been doing a better job than the biologists in collecting the correct tissue. So that's a really nice way that they've been uh, helping out as almost a citizen science part of our surveillance efforts. So just to show you that the sampling went way up when there was a positive detection in 2005, and that level wasn't really sustainable. So it uh, came back down and then we've been able to sustain a testing of about 2,500 samples statewide each year. But the CWD program isn't cheap and that's one of the reasons for having a surveillance program to look where you're going to have uh, the highest probability of detection. And just for the testing, which is paid by the state agencies, that's over $300,000 each year. But we, when we consider the cost of just the outbreak in 2005 was well over $1 million, it makes sense to invest in a strategy to detect the disease early when you have the best chances of managing it or hopefully eliminating it. And the cost of testing and management is well worth it when you consider the economic value of deer industries, whether it's wild deer hunting valued at $1.5 billion in New York when you consider the income generated from licenses, taxes, retail sales, salaries and wages, and that's not even including the venison itself and the recreational value of a day of field. So I did a survey of deer hunters through the National Deer Alliance where we asked hunters how they would describe CWD across these spectrums. And most hunters use the terms like dreadful, increasing, observable, having delayed effects, but the two categories that make me hopeful that slightly more people thought it was controllable and even more people said it was known to science. I get very frustrated uh, by people when they throw up their hands and say, well, we don't know enough about it to, to do anything. Well, we actually do. And we know some of these practices that can help keep the disease out of the state or manage it. One of those that I think is really important to talk about is uh, the controversial use of supplemental feeding of deer, whether that's baiting or direct feeding. So I think the easiest way 
to understand it, this is if you think of yourself at a buffet or now with COVID, remember back to a time when you could go to a buffet and just like with COVID, we wanna keep the deer socially distanced as much as possible and not lure them into one location. So imagine you're at that buffet at Sizzler and imagine there's no sneeze guard, there's no tongs. You just have to stuff your face directly from the feed trough. So how many of you would actually be pretty grossed out by this? We know that shared food resources, whether you're talking about animals or humans, spread disease. And for deer, this isn't just about CWD. There's other diseases like tuberculosis, brucellosis, and Yoni's disease that are uh, devastating for agricultural communities that can all spread in the fluids that deer may potentially leave behind when feeding communally. We also have issues with pests like ticks that are known to occur in higher concentrations around feeding stations. So once you start feeding deer, the population increases to a level that the habitat can't support. And so now you have the slippery slope situation where you have to keep feeding the deer because the population's too high. So you don't want the deer to die. And as you keep doing that, you just have more and more deer and no good mechanism to deal with that. So a, a little history lesson briefly, one of our best accomplishments is uh, the North American model for wildlife conservation, which is predicated upon a concept known as the public trust doctrine. And this is that wildlife are managed for the public to enjoy both now and in future generations. And this is why we have wildlife management agencies. They have a mandate to protect and enhance wildlife populations, including their health and the complex environments in which they live. So this includes moving from a set of narrow stakeholder interests to a more inclusive set of public interests. And one of the key components of this is intergenerational fairness, which must keep options open for future generations. And there are numerous examples of how supplemental feeding can lead to problems decades later. So with CWD, we have a real world public case trust case study. First, the quality of those wildlife resources, our trust, has been diminished because diseased animals are not considered as valuable as a trust resource. resource. Hunters and the public are told not to consume sick animals by the CDC, and oftentimes you have decreased hunter participation in these CWD endemic areas. Hunters in several states have indicated they would not be as likely to participate in recreational activities if CWD was found in their local deer herd. This disease also puts a really severe financial strain on the agencies, as I mentioned for New York, not only from lost revenues from hunting sales and the associated federal funding that's tied to those license sales, but it also redirects financial and personnel resources. An audit in the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources showed that they actually spent $32 million trying to eradicate CWD in the first year after its discovery. And that constituted 83% of the overall expenditures on CWD for those first five years. So the Natural Resource Agency really takes a, a big hit. And you have the ability of these state wildlife agencies to operate effectively as trust manager can be hindered uh, when you have mistrust or lack of cooperation by the public. And you can't use hunting as much as a tool for managing deer populations if you don't have the hunters there, who, if they're scared because of CWD. So to that end, I think that we should apply a concept known as the precautionary principle in these situations. So if there's a situation where we don't have all the information that we'd actually like, we need to think about minimizing the risks to those wildlife resources and taking protective measures. So the precautionary principle is basically the opposite of the burden of proof, which advocates inaction until the cause is proven. So wildlife managers have a social responsibility to protect the wildlife assets of the state of Maine from harm until there's solid evidence that no harm will result. So you've been listening to me uh, talk on for a long time, so we can go ahead and wrap this up. Why is CWD such a big deal? Well, of all the disease control measures that could be applied, the only one that really works for CWD is prevention. Don't get CWD in the first place. Do everything in your power not to bring CWD to Maine. 
it's going to take a long time for deer to move CWD here naturally. So it's going to be coming in at 65 miles per hour if it hasn't already. Because once it's here, there are no ideal control strategies. The only management options include killing the host through culling, sharpshooting, and increasing harvest. And those aren't always publicly popular things. Even if you aren't a hunter, this disease causes ecological, economic, and social problems. We need to make sure that hunters continue to participate to manage deer numbers. We don't want to see the disease spread to new areas or cause issues for agriculture. And I focus mostly on wild deer, but this disease also impacts the captive cervid industry. So if CWD is found on their property, they may face depopulation, quarantines, and double fencing, none of the things that they necessarily want. So to recap, there's a lot of challenges around CWD. One, the animals remain infectious and shedding prions before they ever look sick. I followed my research deer around for years and looked at them several times a week and couldn't pick out the disease one. There have been a lot of calls for a carcass side test that hunters could do themselves. And the truth of the matter is that that isn't going to happen anytime soon. It's just too difficult to test for prions outside of a diagnostic lab and there aren't any vaccination or treatments available anyway. The vaccination trials that were done on elk actually gave the disease to the vaccinated elk faster, and there's no true genetic resistance, so we can't breed resistant animals. Management is extremely difficult in free-ranging herds and involves a lot of deer, and killing a lot of deer. In captive herds, the disease continues to spread despite a USDA certification program. And this disease just wears agencies down. Even if you care about butterflies, any money that would go to butterflies is going to be going to CWD if it's found in Maine. Fish biologists will be collecting deer heads during the hunting season. It consumes wildlife agencies. And like everything these days, there's a ton of politics around CWD, so we don't even have time to delve into that. Now, the good news is the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies produced a CWD best management practices, but it's a roadmap states can follow based on the guidance from scientific experts. As I mentioned before, CWD moves slowly on its own. It's the human assisted movement of live animals, dead animals, and their products that we need to be worried about. The state there are states that have been successful. I talked about New York, but Illinois has been running a sharpshooting program for years that has maintained the disease prevalence at 1%. And we still don't have any documented cases of CWD in humans. So that's very good news. And overall, the vast majority of people support CWD prevention, prevention and management efforts. There's a small but sometimes vocal minority that thinks it's a hoax or a good way for scientists to get rich, which I can personally assure you it is not. So it's not all doom and gloom. You now as an informed person can take precautionary measures to stop CWD because prevention is the most cost-effective strategy. Hunters can take action by talking to other people about CWD, whether it's fellow hunters or even politicians. If you out in the field uh, see a sick deer or moose, report it. Make sure that you follow the regulations on carcass import if you go outside of the state to hunt. And one of the ways that we can make sure to keep get prions out of the environment is to dispose of carcasses in a landfill. The other thing you can do is to maintain a younger deer population at lower densities. And finally, it's really important to maintain the agency's credibility during these times. So you need to stand up and be vocal in your support. Because remember, we're all in this boat together. We all care about our wildlife resources. So we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can in that respect. With that, I will turn it back over to Nate. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Schuler. Um, it was a great presentation, a lot of really helpful information. Um, there are a few questions coming in on the chat. Um, we'll hold some of those to the, to the end and address um, some in the chat as they come in. But just a reminder to our listeners, if you do have questions, um, please uh, type those in and we'll do our best to address those before we wrap up today. Um, next up, we have Nathan Bieber. Nathan is our deer biologist here at Maine Fish and Wildlife. He's based in our Bangor Research and Assessment Office. Uh, Nathan oversees deer management system implementation, working closely with a team of regional biologists to make recommendations for allocating any deer permits and analyzing hunter harvest and biological data. 
He also organizes our chronic wasting disease monitoring efforts and serves as the department spokesperson on white-tailed deer issues. Nathan and some other staff members are currently updating the deer management system to address the priorities described in our new big game management plan. And he's also working with a team of biologists on a deer winter survival study in Maine and New Brunswick. So I'll turn it over to Nathan and Nathan's gonna be talking a little bit more about what we're doing here in Maine to uh, prevent chronic wasting disease. Is the presentation visible? Great, thank you. I'd like to take a few moments here to bring this whole discussion a little bit closer to home and talk about what we're doing here in Maine as far as monitoring for CWD and what a response might look like if CWD were detected here in Maine. As Nate mentioned, every 15 years or so, we go through a process here where we develop a new big game management plan for our department. And during this process, we look at the big game species and we try to define new goals and objectives for the upcoming 10 or 15 years and where we should focus our efforts over that time. Most recently, we wrapped up a planning period in 2017 with our new 2017 big game management plan. And one of the high priority items that was identified during that process was the creation of a chronic wasting disease response plan. This effort response planning and response to CWD is very much an interagency cooperative effort. It involves not only our agency, Maine Fish and Wildlife, but also the Department of Ag Conservation and Forestry who have jurisdiction over captive cervids the USDA Fish Wildlife Services is also very involved as well as the main tribes have all been collaborating on this process. To date, since we don't believe we have CWD here yet in Maine, our focus has been mostly on surveillance and prevention as well. We've been sampling for CWD since 1999. Every year we harvest approximately 500 CWD samples from white-tailed deer and about 20 from moose as well. Most of these samples come from hunter killed animals. So during the hunting seasons in the fall, we have a lot of very readily available samples and we've got regional biologists and myself and contractors in the field and available to collect those very readily available samples. We send those off to a lab out west and we have results on those in about a month's time or so. That surveillance that we do during the hunting season is what's called risk-based surveillance. We can't cover the whole state. We can't sample every deer. So we try to collect samples from higher risk animals that are more likely to have the disease if the disease exists here in Maine. So currently our risk-based surveillance revolves around sampling in towns where we have risk factors such as captive deer facilities, high concentrations of wild deer, such as in natural wintering areas or in feeding operations. And then we also try to sample any sickly appearing individuals. So if we have a member of the public that calls a regional office or a game warden or what have you, and they've seen a deer that looks very emaciated, it's very sickly, it's non-responsive, demonstrating some of the symptoms that Dr. Schuler mentioned in her presentation on a case-by-case -case basis, we will investigate those calls. And if we deem necessary, we will euthanize those sickly appearing animals to test those as well. We also do some opportunistic sampling from mostly road kills. And we try again to target the higher risk samples, these being road kill deer, particularly adults and bucks. CWD has a pretty long incubation period. So we're more likely to detect it in an adult deer if we sample from an adult. And as Dr. Schuler mentioned in the presentation, males are a bit more likely to carry the disease than females. So a really good opportunistic sample for us then would be a road-killed deer, particularly an adult buck. In 2018, we also started collecting some samples along the main Quebec border. After they detected CWD in their captive red deer farm out there, they 
the Quebec agency started doing some wild deer culling and testing, and thankfully they did not detect any CWD in their wild deer. But just out of an abundance of caution, we do know that a lot of our deer move between Maine and Quebec, so we are sampling along the Maine Quebec border and treating those as slightly higher risk areas as well for CWD to potentially come into the state. We'll continue to do that sort of border surveillance over the next several years. So if CWD was found in Maine, what would response look like? It would vary a little bit if it were detected in wild deer versus in captive deer, but by and large, our agency's part in things would look pretty similar in either case. It would involve having sort of layers of response and protection where you've got the most aggressive response activities occurring right around the infected area and then less aggressive response activities radiating outward from that initial detection. At first, we would establish what would be called an infected zone. This would be an area directly around where the positive animal came from. And in this area, we would have our most aggressive response activities. We'd be using agency person personnel in these areas to cull deer, to remove as many deer as we can, to reach a certain quota. And then we would test all of those animals to determine what is the geographic distribution of the disease, and of the animals in that area, what is the prevalence of the disease? In a step down in terms of aggressiveness, we'd have around that infected zone, a control area. In that control area, we would rely on hunter harvest and we would increase opportunity for hunters to take animals in this control area. And then all hunter killed animals in that control area would have to be tested for CWD. And we would also very closely monitor and regulate what deer and deer parts can move in and out of that control area. And then lastly, in a third layer of response and surveillance radiating outward from the infected zone, we would just have a surveillance zone. This would be mostly business as usual, but the areas in the surveillance zone would be added to our regular harvest surveillance. So any regular hunter killed deer in that surveillance zone would be a deer that we would try to collect a sample from for testing. Now, early detection is very important with CWD and whether or not we believe we've detected the disease early or not will likely influence what our course of action is going forward. Ideally, we would seek to eradicate the disease, but there may be some situations where that doesn't look possible and we'll just look to contain and limit the spread. So if, for example, we have an infected zone where deer densities are very low and where our initial culling and testing efforts reveal that the disease is not widespread, maybe we don't even find any more positive cases. In a situation like that, which is kind of the ideal scenario, we would seek to eradicate the disease entirely, where we would keep deer densities low in that area, continue testing, and hopefully after a period of years, we would not be finding any more positive animals and we could consider the disease to have been eradicated. However, there may be situations where maybe we find inside the infected zone, more infected animals or a lot of infected animals, or perhaps even in the control area and surveillance zone, we find infected animals. If it's an area with a very high deer density and we're finding all these additional CWD positive animals, we may have to focus instead on just containing the disease. It may not be possible to eradicate it. So in that case, our goal is not to get rid of it, but rather to stop the disease from spreading elsewhere in the state and try to limit it to where we initially detected it. We would maintain low deer densities in areas like that and continue to surveil and hopefully keep prevalence of the disease down. Now there's a few added wrinkles with a captive deer facility. As I mentioned, the Department of Ag Conservation and Forestry has jurisdiction over captive deer, so they'd be very heavily involved in this part. If CWD were found in captive deer in Maine, we'd look to quarantine that facility and conduct a risk assessment. So we'd wanna take a look at that farm, see what risk factors exist. Are deer in the farm potentially coming into contact with deer outside the farm, wild deer? What does the fencing situation look like? What is the escape history of that farm? And based on these different risk factors that we that we see in the risk assessment will determine what the best course of action is from there and create a herd plan for that captive farm. On our end, the main fish and wildlife end, we would 
right around that farm area. We would cull deer and test those deer to determine if the disease had spread into the wild. And then we'd be following those similar steps mentioned on the previous slide. So again, what can you do to help? First and foremost, you are the eyes in the field. There's only so many of us on our staff and there's a lot more of you out there. If you see a deer that looks suspicious and very poor body conditions, showing some neurological symptoms, we want you to give us a call. Call a local warden, call your nearest regional office, and we can assess that case with you. And based on each case, we'll determine what the best course of action is, but we may, we may want to euthanize that animal and test it if it's displaying some of these symptoms. Also very important that you know and follow their game regulations and all the different regulations related to carcass movement. So here in Maine, if you shot a deer in a jurisdiction other than New Hampshire, you can only bring into Maine or possess boned out meat, hardened antlers, clean skull caps, capes and hides with no skull, teeth and finished mouths. So these are low risk materials. The idea here is we don't want someone say harvesting a deer in Pennsylvania, for example, where they've got CWD and then maybe bringing it back whole carcass into Maine, butchering it on their property and leaving the carcass on the landscape where a wild deer might come into contact with it and be at risk of infection. Uh, again, I mentioned New Hampshire is an exception. There's a lot of movement over the border between Maine and New Hampshire hunters. So at present, there is an exception for New Hampshire, but from everywhere else, only low risk materials can come into Maine. And lastly, stay informed. We do know a lot about CWD now, but we're continuing to learn more and more. So just stay informed, uh, follow the spread of the disease across the country, pay attention to new regulations. And if you wanna learn more and you're curious about the disease and what you can do, feel free to reach out to myself or a warden or a biologist and we'll get you in touch with the right people. So all of your questions can be answered. Great, thank you so much, Nathan. Um, we've had quite a few questions come in through the chat, so I'll, I'll try to um, pitch some of those to, to both Nathan and Dr. Schuler, and, um, and hopefully we can get some answers to some of those. There's some really good questions there. Um, there's a number of questions related to feeding deer. Um, Nathan, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the current laws and regulations surrounding feeding deer in, in Maine, um, and also what people might be able to do if they have a, a neighbor that's feeding deer. Um, there's some course of action that they could take to perhaps convince that person that feeding deer isn't a good idea. Feeding deer is a very hot button topic in Maine. It's got a long tradition in Maine and it's a very politically charged issue. Currently you can legally feed deer from, I believe it's December 1st to June 15th. It's currently legal to do that. Um, there are definitely better practices if you are gonna feed deer. If you are going to feed deer and you're set on it, you should definitely stay away from roads. You should try to spread that food out on the landscape. Don't just put it in a big pile and definitely watch what you feed. If you do have a neighbor that's feeding and it's causing problems, this presentation is gonna be available and it would be a great resource to point them towards. And uh, feel free to reach out to myself or a regional biologist. We're happy to talk with folks like that and talk about the risk factors. And then if they are insistent, talk about how they can do it to minimize some of those risks. Great, thanks, Nathan. Um, Dr. Schuler, there are a few questions about urine-based lures and scents. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the risk that those um, may pose and if there's any testing that's done on those products? Absolutely, yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so as I mentioned in the presentation that before an animal ever looks sick, it's actually shedding prions in its saliva, feces and urine. And that can happen as soon as three months after they get infected. So that deer is, is out there and um, shedding that. So the issue with some of these products um, is that they're collected from captive cervid facilities. And if you remember back to the map that I showed, there have been quite a number of captive cervid facilities that have discovered CWD. And the issue 
that we run into is if they're collecting urine products that they may be collecting it and those are distributed before they ever actually detect the disease. So they would be out the door and there's not really a good mechanism to recover those products. Um, they are uh, the industry, a uh, number of the major producers have started trying to test their products for prions um, and they have a private company that's doing that. I'm not exactly well versed in it, but they're putting labels on their bottles that say like RT quick check. Um, so that, that would be something to look for. The issue that we run into as well is not only could the urine uh, potentially have prions in it, but then if you're using it as an attractant, you're congregating animals together to a particular spot. And that could present, even if the urine didn't have it, if animals are getting together, just like with the feeding issue, that could spread disease uh, more quickly. So it's the opposite of what we wanna do with the, the social distancing issues. And uh, these prions, like I mentioned, they get in the soil, they bind to the soil. And when they're bound to the soil, they actually become more infectious. So potentially by using urine uh, or other lures that would attract these animals, you create a hot spot of disease where you least want it where you're hunting. Great, thank you. And just to add to that a little bit, um, here in Maine, urine-based lures, they are currently legal. Um, there, there's currently no prohibition against purchasing or using uh, those products. Um, that issue is, is raised in our chronic waste and disease prevention and response plan. It would require legislation to change that. So through the legislature and, and um, a, a law change, it's not something the department can do by ourselves. Um, but that is an issue that we're, we're aware of and have had some discussions with our legislative committee about. So it's something that we're certainly um, talking about and, and there may be some effort to address that down the road. Um, Dr. Shuler, there was a, a question um, from a hunter safety instructor act, actually asking whether an infected deer is safe to eat. And I know you talked about that a little bit, but I wonder if you could just touch on that again. Sure, I think it's, it's important to note that uh, this is guidance coming from the CDC that they are saying that you should not knowingly consume a CWD positive animal. So if an animal's tested, it comes back as being positive, that's a situation where you should get in touch with the agency so they can dispose of that meat properly. You don't wanna just you know, throw it out back to uh, feed the coyotes because that again would be potentially putting prions on the landscape. So if you know it's infected, please don't eat it and call the agency to get it properly disposed of. Great, thank you. Um, Another question, Dr. Schuler. There's there's one about deer corn and other similar products, which, as Nathan mentioned, they are sold in Maine. Um, is there any risk of CWD coming in via those products, given that many of them are grown in the Midwest where CWD is present? And if so, is there any testing that's done on those products? Well, I'll answer that one backwards. So there is no testing done on the products. And that actually is a really big concern um, that some of these products where they're grown, that they may have prions and movement of agricultural products may spread prions. So in Europe, uh, they've detected CWD in uh, Norway, Finland, and Sweden. And some other European countries have banned movement of some agricultural products related to that. So it's not out of the realm of possibility that it maybe they're not in the products, but even the perception of risk may cause a ban. So there's no testing on that corn um, for prions. And I don't know that that's something that has been actively pursued. I know that um, in addition to the European countries, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency was really worried about movement of agricultural products uh, spreading prions, but it's one of those things that it's it's kind of a big black box and it would have enormous ramifications. So right now, I think everybody's kind of just trying to ignore it. Great, thank you. Um, so I did just want to uh, point out that Colonel Dan Scott of the Warden Service, who's, who's listening in, 
um, wanted to uh, clarify that the dates for which it is legal to feed deer are from December 16th to May 31st. So feeding deer or placing food known to be attractive to deer is prohibited from June 1st to December 15th. So just wanted to add that clarification, make sure there's no confusion on that. Um, there's also a question I see, a couple questions about what happens if you harvest an infected deer and will IF and W give you a different tag? Um, I'll maybe have Nathan address that a little bit, but um, you know, certainly we do occasionally um, issue tags to hunters that have harvested a diseased animal that is clearly not fit for human consumption. Um, this I think is perhaps a bit of a different situation because of the time lag um, during which we would have to wait for those results to come back. I don't know, Nathan, if you have anything to, to add on that issue. It's a bridge we haven't had to cross yet, thankfully. There is a lag period even for an individual sample where you're probably waiting two weeks to get results from a tested deer. And those tests would be done during a very high volume part of the year. So it might be even a longer wait than that, which adds, adds a wrinkle to things. Um, currently, as Nate mentioned, if there's a disease that we agree is not fit con for consumption, we will issue a different tag. But if CWD were found in Maine, we might be looking at a large number of animals where that was the case. So that's a, a bridge we haven't had to cross yet and will definitely require some more discussion and probably be on kind of a case by case basis. Great, thank you. Um, Nathan, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about um, the captive deer industry in Maine and just kind of what that looks like and approximately how many operations there are here in the state. The last list I had of captive facilities had about 27, I believe, captive deer farms and uh, around 10, maybe 11, what are called commercial large game shooting areas. These are areas where captive animals are held and hunted. Most of these captive deer farms and facilities are kind of mom and pop operations where they maybe have a few pet animals, a few red deer, reindeer, a fallow deer, something like that. But we do have a handful, three, four, five, maybe larger farms that have stock in the number of hundreds of animals, hundreds of red deer, things like that. So that's kind of what the current status is as far as how prevalent it is in Maine. We've had more facilities closing of late than opening seems to be the, the trend now. Great, thanks, Nathan. Um, there are a couple questions about um, from folks that are wondering if they want to get their deer tested, is there a way for them to do that? We don't currently offer hunter tests by request. We just collect samples from samples that are in our sampling stratum. So those higher risk towns is where we collect their samples from and they're pretty much random samples. They're not people requesting that their deer is tested. There's not currently a lab that I'm aware of that will just take requests from the public. It's usually large batches from state agencies that they deal with. I don't know, if, Dr. Schuler, if you have anything to, to add to that, if you're aware of any labs that would be available for the public to submit samples. So right now in New York, uh, in the last few years, we implemented a program where hunters could submit their deer from New York to get tested. And we've actually had very few hunters request that. So I don't think the demand has been there to push a lot of other diagnostic labs to do that yet. Um, you know, if we, we've kind of focused on New York and haven't tested from other states yet, but if that's a real concern for people, we can have that conversation about, you know, doing out of state animals in, in which the situation would be that, you know, ideally you'd want to have the, the samples taken and not have to ship the whole deer head. So the samples that we take for CWD testing are the retropharyngeal lymph nodes, which are kind of down in the throat behind the lower jaw or part of the brainstem, the ovex. Those are, are the tissues where the prion concentrations are the highest. So that's what we want to test for. And in New York, a hunter could just drop off the head or, or mail a head in and we'll pull those tissues to make sure that we get the right ones. Um, in Maine, you know, I'm certain we could set up something if you 
if you need it, there's only uh, certain diagnostic labs that actually run the CWD testing. And unfortunately there aren't other ones in the Northeast. Uh, I think Cornell and Pennsylvania are, are probably the closest ones. So that would be something that we could work out as a service with the agency. But until CWD is sort of discovered in Maine through all the surveillance methods that, the, that Nate, uh, Nathan talked about, it's probably not really worthwhile to get your, an, your individual animal tested um, because the surveillance that the state is doing is um, the best method. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Schuler. there's a, a question about um, prions in meat as opposed to the spinal cord and, and brain. So is there, are there prions in the meat of, of deer? There are, uh, but they are at much lower concentration than what we see in the brain and the spinal cord. So the prions tend to concentrate in uh, the lymph nodes and in the, ner the nervous tissue. So the fact that you know, there's nerves going through the muscles, then there's going to be prions associated with that, but it's a um, much lower concentration. And that's one of the reasons why deboned meat coming back to the state is a much lower risk, as Nathan said, than um, whole carcasses or uh, heads that haven't been taxidermied that might still have the, the brain material in them. That th those are the products that we don't want coming back, that you don't want coming into your state. Great, thank you. So I actually have a question that hasn't come up in the chat, but it's, it's one that I think a lot about. Um, so in, in Northern Maine, Western Maine, down East Maine, we have a, a pretty unique resource. We have a, a, a very low density deer population, but um, the age structure is very good. There's a lot of mature bucks. Um, however, in that part of the state, due to winter severity, the deer congregate in winter, winter yards, deer yards um, to, to make it through the winter. And in some cases, we can have dozens or hundreds of deer in a, a very congregated setting that have migrated in from, in some cases, quite a large different uh, distance. So I wonder, and this is a question for both of you, what um, a situation like that might mean for CWD and the potential for it to spread within what is otherwise a pretty low density population, but seasonally they're very congregated. I'll take it first from a sort of a more theoretical standpoint. I mean, this is one of the reasons why we want to go back to all the prevention because that is sort of a, a worst case scenario where you do have deer that are low density, which is what you want, but because they migrate and they could move the disease with them and then spread it when they're on those wintering grounds to other animals and who would then migrate into different areas that would cause uh, the disease to spread much faster in, in further directions. And then the agency would have a larger area that you would have to put um, more restrictions in place. So those are the types of areas that you really want to protect because you've got it great right now, you know, with the, the low density and older age classes, but those older age class bucks are the ones that are, are thought to be responsible for spreading the disease the most because they have a lot of contact with other males during the off season and then a lot of contact with females during the breeding season. So that's why we see such high prevalence in those animals. So related to that question, and there's a few coming in on the chat, um, more specifically related to feeding, Nathan, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about just the situation with feeding in Maine and some of the complexity that we see here in the department um, with regard to what it might mean for, um, you know, short-term implications for deer survival on the landscape. And, you know, there's risks of vehicle collisions and obviously there's, you know, the elephant in the room, chronic oasis disease. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that issue. It's a big one for us. Feeding is a huge issue from us. It's a, it's, a very, it's a very big issue. I would say that statewide, we don't know exactly how widespread the practice is. I think in Southern Maine and Northern Maine, it looks quite a bit different where your Southern Maine feeding operations are more kind of backyard feeders where people like to watch deer in their backyard and feed pretty small amounts or maybe incidentally feed deer with bird feed and things like that. But in northern Maine, in, western, in the western mountains, and in some parts of down east Maine as well, feeding operations are much more organized and much more large scale, where 
people aren't just feeding deer to watch them, they're feeding deer because they feel like they have to, to sustain the deer through the winter. I would disagree with them that that's not often the case. However, in a lot of Northern Maine, the traditional winter cover that deer used is no longer there. And a lot of the cover that is there is not being used by deer. They're kind of migrating to towns these, these days where they're receiving supplemental feed and that's how they're getting through the winter, whether they need it or not, that's, that's what they're doing. And so there's definitely a feeling in a lot of these places that if people stop feeding, that deer would suffer. There is evidence in the literature that during a severe winter, artificial feeding can increase survival rates, but you really have to weigh that. There's a lot of costs that go along with that one potential benefit. Disease spread is definitely a big cost as we've mentioned here today. So it's a very complex issue. It comes up in the legislature frequently. We often have bills come forward that are related to deer and deer feeding and um, it's just a really big issue with a lot of history that's very politically charged. I think there are some cases where deer probably do benefit somewhat from feeding, whether those benefits are outweighing the negatives, that's questionable, but there are some feeding practices that are better than others. And we're working to put out more literature for the people who are going to feed while it is legal so that they can do it a little bit better. So feeding away from roads, spreading feed out, feeding the right foods, feeding at the right time of year, et cetera. Great, thank you, Nathan. And as you said, it, it really is a huge issue for us. The department has long had the position that um, you know, feeding isn't desirable um, in Maine for a variety of reasons. Um, however, it is legal and it, in some parts of the state, in some areas, it is pervasive. So. Um, it's a very, as you said, politically and socially charged issue that it involves um, not just our agency, but the legislature and the public at large. It's, uh, there's a lot of public discourse on that issue that continues to evolve. Um, Dr. Schuler, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about moose. We've obviously been focusing mostly on deer, but Maine is known for its moose population as, as well. Do moose pose a risk of getting CWD? And if so, how high do you think that risk is? Yeah, unfortunately, uh, moose do get CWD. They've uh, seen moose with CWD in a number of Western states and provinces where uh, the disease is endemic. So, you know, if they have overlapping whitetail, mule deer, moose, elk populations that have CWD, there's been um, a number of, of moose that have contracted CWD that way in North America. So it's definitely a risk. And given that Maine has, you know, some areas of higher density moose populations, if it got into moose in Maine, that's um, something that you may see a lot more of. So another reason why prevention is good because the moose are just as at risk with uh, the disease as other, other populations. So um, as far as other moose in Scandinavia, they have discovered what they think is a spontaneous strain of CWD because their moose tend to get much older. You know, they're 19, 20 years old that occurs um, in those populations. That's not something that we've seen in North America. We have the same strain of CWD in our deer that have shown up in moose. So that's um, a different situation, but the nice thing is because the Scandinavian countries are doing more research on CWD and moose versus the you know dozen or so cases that we've had in North America, we're going to try to learn from what they're doing. Great, thank you. Um, so there's, there was a question about um, some information from our department about CWD being transmissible via optical tools at optometrist office. I don't, I'm not familiar with that. I don't believe there's been any information to that effect from our department. I wonder if that could have been something that was COVID related perhaps from another state agency, but um, I'm not aware that our agency has put out any information on that subject specifically. Um, maybe a question for you, Dr. Schuler. There's uh, one about if there's any physical signs that hunters or the public can be look, looking out for um, that may be indicative of CWD? Absolutely. Uh, so animals with CWD don't show signs until the very end stages. Um, but if they do, you'll see they'll kind of um, 
be emaciated. So their uh, hip bones might be sticking out. You might be able to see their, their spine a little bit more. They're gonna be very skinny. A lot of times their ears are going to be drooping, will be drooling. Uh, you might be able to walk right up to one. Um, so yeah, they just, it's, they develop holes in their brain. They're not able to function normally. And uh, a, a lot of the cases we've seen have had aspiration pneumonia where they actually choke on their own saliva and, and get uh, things into their lungs and, and die that way. But the vast majority of CWD animals are going to be killed by something else before they get to those stages. So they're gonna be shot by a hunter, they're gonna be hit by a car. Um, and the other thing is those signs, you know, an emaciated deer might be a sign of a lot of other things. You know, it may have a brain abscess. It, it you know, may have a different disease. So they aren't um, completely exclusive to CWD, which is why it's really important to um, call your, your local biologist or uh, game warden to report those so that the, the agency can get those in to be tested. That's a really good source of uh, information for them. Great, thank you so much. Um, I, I think we've addressed all the questions in the chat. Um, just taking a quick look to make sure. I wonder uh, to kind of close out, um, maybe I'll, I'll put this to you, Dr. Schuler. Do you have any advice for Maine given our situation here? Um, we, as far as we know, don't have CWD. Do you have any sort of parting words of wisdom for us given the situation that we're in? Yeah, I think that right now you're far enough away from CWD that if people can, one, not bring it in and two, not spread it, uh, if it does get here, those are the most important things. And I know you're having, there's people that love wildlife and they wanna feed them. And that is, you know, great in concept, but in practice, it really could do a lot of damage. And so thinking about that sort of beyond just your own short-term enjoyment. Like I started the presentation off, you know, I, I used to talk about this disease in terms of like, you know, think about the, the opportunities for your grandkids. And what we've seen with CWD moving across the country, how quickly the prevalence rates are going up. A lot of people know about exponential curves now because of COVID. So that's what we see with CWD. It starts out slowly and then it increases. So you might not, like it's much better to go in place now with the preventative measures because I'm worried about my son and his opportunities because we're seeing things accelerate so quickly. So anything you can do um, to not get it at this point is the absolute best thing. So there's a bunch of practices that people can take and, and take ownership of that so that they're actively working against getting CWD because once states get it, it's really difficult to manage and it harms a lot of other uh, resources. Thank you, that's great advice. Um, I, I think we'll uh, kind of looking at the chat and it looks like um, things have uh, kind of tapered off and I'd like to, I guess, close by um, thanking you, Dr. Schuler, and you, um, Nathan, for your time today and your expertise and spending a few minutes talking to us all about chronic wasting disease. Um, you know, we've had a lot of interest in terms of live attendance on the presentation today. We will be saving this presentation on our YouTube channel and we'll be distributing it um, as best we can uh, using as many outlets as we can to try to get the word out. And we'd encourage all of those folks that are listening in to do the same and to share this with your networks. Um, We'll, we also will um, post a link to our website with some additional information on chronic wasting disease that again, we would encourage, encourage anyone that's listening in to share that with your, your networks and neighbors and, and fellow hunters. So um, thank you so much to our panelists and thank you so much to members of the public that have listened today. And again, please help us spread the message, spread the word, and we're hopeful we can keep this disease out of Maine. Thanks everyone for joining today.